What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Dark Season 3 Episode 6 titled Light and Shadow. This video will of course have spoilers through Episode 6, but I haven't watched Episode 7 or 8 in the third season, so no spoilers for those episodes. Before we dive into it, quick reminder to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. With that, let's jump into the episode. Some overall thoughts on the episode before we go into the recap. First, I thought this was sort of a powerhouse episode for Lisa Vicari, who plays Marta. She had to show a range of emotions throughout the episode and basically had tears in her eyes in every scene, and I thought she killed it. Also, we finally got to see adult Bartosz, so that was pretty exciting. And Adam and Eva's motivations seem to have become clear. Eva wants to ensure the apocalypse occurs on both worlds and that the knot is sustained. I think that she wants to do that really just to maintain her own existence and the existence of all her friends and family. On the flip side, Adam wants to destroy the knot essentially as a mercy killing. I think he sees the world they've created as a sort of living hell, but it's unclear to me if he's simply trying to erase the bubble of him and all the family trees that are connected, or if he's literally trying to destroy the whole world. In either case, we know that he is trying to wipe from existence all our favorite characters. Now, where Eva and Adam's plans overlap is that they both want to ensure that all the events in the cycle occur as they have previously, but for different reasons. Eva wants them to repeat so she can maintain the existence of the knot. Adam wants them to repeat so the timeline can get to the point where Adam himself exists. He has the God particle and can take the dark matter to its final purpose, using it to destroy Marta's unborn child and destroy the knot. This was also, I thought, the most confusing episode yet. It was pretty dense, so as we go through the recap, I'll try not to dwell too much on the simple stuff and get to the complex stuff that we really need to hash out. With that, let's dive into the recap. We start off in what looks like 2020 on the Prime World. We revisit the moment of the apocalypse right after Marta died when Jonas looks up and sees the other Marta there. Except this time he doesn't see an other Marta and instead Jonas runs downstairs to the basement and seems to survive the apocalypse on his own. Then we quickly realize this is a dream slash memory of the older Jonas who wakes up still in 1888. This was one of the first jaw-dropping moments of the episode because we finally explicitly acknowledge the existence of two contradictory Jonases with two unique timelines. One that left with Marta and died, and one that stayed behind to become older Jonas and ultimately Adam. That, of course, gets explained later in the episode, and we'll get to that. In 1888, older Jonas reads Marta's letter, and we finally get to see its contents. It essentially says... Jonas, you will make everything right again, don't lose hope, but you have to let the apocalypse happen, you have to let me die so I can live, and we are a perfect match. Jonas burns the letter. Later in the episode, we'll see Marta actually writing this letter, and at that point, we'll dive a little bit into why I think this letter was given to Jonas in the first place. Going over to the alternate world in 2019, we follow Charlotte and Ulrich in the hours leading up to the apocalypse. Charlotte shows up at Hannah and Ulrich's place and shows Ulrich that a microscopic investigation of the penny that was found in the bunker versus the penny that Helga has proves they are the same penny. Charlotte begins to believe in time travel. And I'll say that I think the show this season has mostly been firing on all cylinders. I do have a couple of minor complaints. One of them would be the affair between Ulrich and Charlotte on the alternate world. I feel that it's been pretty underdeveloped and I 
generally don't buy it. Now, it's been underdeveloped because there are so many other things going on that we care about a lot more than this affair in the alternate world, so it's really just a minor quibble. With this new evidence of time travel, Ulrich goes to look at Mad's body. He notices the scar on his chin and finally becomes convinced that this is not just a boy who looks like Mads, this is Mads himself who somehow time traveled. Ulrich goes to see Helga in lockup, sort of interrogates him a little bit, and ultimately lets Helga go so he can follow him into the caves to the metal doors and begin his time travel journey. Then we jump over to the prime world in 2053 where Marta is hanging out with Adam. And I had to keep straight which Martas we're talking about in this episode because there are so many of them. You of course have Eva, the older Marta. Then you have middle-aged Marta, but there are actually three iterations of young Marta running around. There's the youngest of the Martas, the one who just watched Jonas die and is now scrambling a few hours before the apocalypse in 2019. Then there's the slightly older Marta, and by slightly older, I mean days or weeks, the one that ditched older Jonas in 1888. She's the one that's currently on the prime world with Adam, the one we're talking about here. Then there's an even older Marta, the one that has a scar over her eye, the one that actually killed Jonas. So, sticking with the Marta that ditched older Jonas in 1888, she's now in 2053 with Adam, Celia puts this Marta into a cage with no explanation. Then Adam shows up, ignores Marta's shouts about why she's locked up, and Adam monologues about how old Tonhaus thought that he could create a paradise. Adam realized what paradise really is. It is eternal darkness in which nothing exists. But for that, the apocalypse must happen in my world and in yours. Adam leaves Marta, and Marta yells after him. But it always breaks my heart a little bit when Marta yells, not Adam, but Jonas, because that reminds you of the tragedy that Jonas becomes this awful person. So as I alluded to at the beginning of this video, Adam is beginning to make his motivations clear. Basically, we're living in hell, and the only paradise we can ask for is eternal darkness, where nothing exists. Celia lets Marta out and then makes her change clothes. Marta asks Celia why she follows Adam, and she just replies with rhetoric. We, the chosen few, must fill the gaps, so you can find your way here, and Adam his, and will finally find salvation. So essentially, Celia is saying that we need to fill the gaps. We need to make sure that all of the events in the cycle occur as planned, so you end up here, Adam ends up here, all the pieces fall into place so we can find salvation. Though it's unclear if Celia and the other followers know that by salvation, Adam means the absolute destruction of everything. Then we see Adam send Francisca and Magnus into the God Particle. This is very similar to when we saw Agnes head into the God Particle, then we saw Charlotte and Elizabeth head in there, and now we're seeing Francisca and Magnus. Seemingly, they're all heading into various places of the time stream to, as Celia said, ensure that everything in the cycle occurs as planned. Now let's check in on the other Marta, the youngest Marta, the one that's in the alt world in 2019, hours before the apocalypse. She gets home after witnessing Jonas die and does the manic hand scrubbing, trying to get all the blood out of her hands. She freaks out at the blood on her clothes, in her hair. Then then Magnus shows up, and he's very concerned about Marta, but also angry about what Marta did to their mother, because Katerina has been worried all day about where Marta has been. Magnus does a good job of consoling her with a hug, but then Marta tries to warn him about the apocalypse and everything that she went through. And Magnus goes from a concerned brother doing a great job consoling her to, I haven't got time for your psycho crap. Then he leaves. Marta looks at the blood in her hair 
and cuts it off, taking one step closer to becoming the time-traveling Marta we saw in the season two finale. I liked that there was an in-story explanation for why her hair gets shortened, rather than just she wanted to change her hairstyles as she became more badass. Then she has a heart-to-heart -heart with her mom, Katarina. Marta asks Katarina if she believes in fate, and Katarina says no, we make our own choices, and offers to be someone Marta can talk to. Then Marta leaves to stop the apocalypse. I don't have too much to say about that scene besides... Lisa Vicari kills it in that scene, as she does throughout the episode. Meanwhile, Alexander Tiedemann, no idea that he has this role to play in the apocalypse, is on the phone with Obendorf, who helped to hide all the barrels of cesium, talking about those barrels. Then Barto shows up, and Alexander decides to come clean about his past. He tells his son Bartosz that... I'm being blackmailed, and I murdered someone. My real name is Boris. The murder was an accident. I am not a murderer. Bartosz asks if mom knew about this, his mom, Regina. And Alexander says that Regina was the best thing that ever happened to him. She saved him from his criminal past, but she didn't know the truth about what happened. Bartosz doesn't take the news well, and he leaves. In this scene, both characters, Alexander and Bartosz, gained some points for me. I've always liked Alexander for some reason. He just seems like such a put-together character, and I've always kind of just glossed over his messy past. But here, I like the fact that he's decided to come clean, and it seems he's going to take responsibility for everything. I also love that Bartosz's immediate concern was did mom know about this that's awesome and i don't even need to praise the acting because the acting for everybody is top notch on this show later alexander looks at a picture of his wife and i think that tugs at his heartstrings a little bit and further moves him to come clean he calls charlotte and asks her to come to the power plant so he can show her something and basically he plans to show her the barrels and come clean about the cover-up at the nuclear plant. Marta, while Alexander is out, finds Bartosz and tells him everything in detail about what she's been through, recruits him to the cause of preventing the apocalypse. He tries to call Alexander, but Alexander is not picking up. So Marta and Bartosz get on their bike and head to the power plant. They are trying to stop the impending apocalypse on their own. But on their way there, Bartosz and Marta are stopped by an older Magnus and Francisca, the ones that Adam sent through the God Particle earlier in the episode. They tell Marta that Eve and middle-aged Marta are lying to you. They don't want to stop the apocalypse. In fact, they're the ones who make it happen in the first place. But we know how to change it. You have to come to our world and trust Jonas. Now, with Jonas, if you want to manipulate him to get him to do what you want, you need to dangle the carrot of, we can save Marta in front of him. With Marta, it's the opposite. At the mention of Jonas and the fact that he is still alive, they win Marta over to their side. They tell Marta, you need to come with us, and then you need to go save Jonas from the apocalypse right before it happens on his world. Now, as a reminder, Adam wants to ensure that events occur as they did before. He needs to maintain the cycle up to the point that Adam himself exists. He has the God particle, he has the machine, and he can erase the knot. So, Magnus and Francisca here are taking this Marta and will send her to become the Marta that we saw in the season two finale that rescues Jonas and brings him to her world. Back on the Prime world in 2020, Claudia follows a map left to her by Claudia from the other world. Following this map in the nuclear plant, she gets to the God Particle, which is just a little baby God Particle right now. She slowly reaches for it before someone shouts, Stop! Looking over, we see that that someone is young Jonas. My jaw has dropped many times throughout the season, but this is probably the lowest it's dropped. Even though we saw that flashback at the beginning of the episode to the Jonas that survived the apocalypse without being saved by Marta, it was still crazy to see this still alive young Jonas. 
He explains that the time tunnel no longer exists under the cave, but if he can stabilize the god particle, he can go back in time and save everyone. Then Jonas sees that Claudia still has a time machine, but she explains it's broken. Now, in this situation, Claudia knows she needs to manipulate Jonas into following the events of the time cycle as they happened before. She's been recruited to Eva's side, so she wants to maintain the existence of the knot, ensure that events repeat. However, she doesn't yet have the finesse to manipulate yet, so she makes a half-hearted attempt. She says to Jonas, well, maybe you just need to wait 33 years, you know, go through the cycle again, and then try again. Jonas doesn't want to do that. He says, I don't have time to wait 33 years. And what am I supposed to do? Manipulate my younger self? Lie to my younger self again? But Claudia knows what to say. I can help you save Marta. And like that, she has recruited Jonas to her cause. I went through a range of emotions in this scene. It started with, holy crap, Jonas is back but ended with, it's kind of sad to see a Jonas that hasn't learned the lessons that our Jonas did the last few episodes. Primarily, trust no one. Eva is lying to you. There is another world out there. All those lessons, all that knowledge gained the last few episodes is gone. We rewind to a more naive Jonas, and it was kind of sad to see that. By the way, before we continue, just wanted to quickly chime in to remind you, if you're enjoying this video, to please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. Back to the show. Meanwhile, on the alternate world in 2052, we're in Eva's lair, and we see Marta with the scar over her eye, the one that killed Jonas. Middle-aged Marta tells younger Marta, you two are wrong for each other in his world and in ours. You'll learn to let him go. Later, we see middle-aged Marta and Eva looking over this younger Marta's shoulder while she writes the letter that Jonas receives from Marta. Now, why are they writing this letter? Everything Eva does is to maintain the existence of the knot, meaning everything in the timeline needs to be repeated in the cycle. I'm assuming this letter is something that Jonas needs to receive in order to give older Jonas hope to keep going, not realizing that everything he's doing, all of the experiments with the God particle, is ultimately leading him on the path to the apocalypse and on the path to becoming Adam. Then we get to the fun part. Younger Marta asks Eva why Jonas is still alive in his world, considering she shot and killed him last episode. Now, I'm going to do my best to explain it to the best that I understand it. Eva draws an infinity symbol in front of Marta, and she explains that either loop in the infinity symbol represents both worlds. Both worlds have a time loop that meet in that middle point, the middle of the infinity symbol. When Marta goes to save Jonas, that happens at this junction in time. And at that point, she can decide to either go to Jonas's world and rescue him or not. Either choice can be made. And either choice is represented by the inside of the infinity symbol or the outside. Whether or not she saves him just determines what side of that line you're on, but in either case, you're still following that loop. Eva calls them overlapping realities, meaning Marta can choose to save Jonas or not. However, in this world, both choices happen simultaneously. Both realities exist. Marta saves him, he goes to her world and gets killed. At the same time, Marta doesn't save him, the Jonas goes on to become older Jonas and eventually Adam. The main takeaway is that when one universe interacts with the other and tries to inflict some change on it, it's very difficult to do that because when you do it, essentially you also don't do it and both realities overlap and exist simultaneously. To really boil it down to the main thing that we need to understand as an audience, I think, is that if you're trying to destroy something in the other world or something that exists in both world, it's very difficult or impossible to do so. That's relevant because that is the obstacle that Adam needs to overcome. 
Adam wants to destroy the knot. To do that, he needs to kill Marta's unborn child. This unborn child is born of both worlds, so if Adam attempts to kill it, you get the Jonas problem, where he both kills it and doesn't kill it simultaneously, and the loop continues. So that is the obstacle that Adam needs to overcome. As Eva says, our worlds cannot be separated from one another. Later, we see that Eva has collected a bunch of people that play important roles in the time stream when it comes to keeping that cycle going, keeping the knot alive. And she says to all of them, Adam has moved each of his pieces into position. It's time that we do the same. This knot has given us all life and we are its keepers in both worlds. He'll never be able to untie the knot. Then she places her hand on Marta's womb. In all these years, he hasn't understood how everything is really connected, how everything ends and begins, not only in our world, but also in his. We are destiny. Then she goes one by one through everybody there and gives them some parting words regarding their specific mission as they travel back in time, and in some cases to our prime world. She speaks to the Marta with a scar over her eye. Middle-aged Marta, adult Bartosz. Hey, we get to finally meet adult Bartosz. She speaks to Claudia, Egon. By the way, did not expect to see Egon in 2052 here. She speaks to Noah and she speaks to young Noah. Each of them are being sent to different points, like I said, in the timeline, on our world or hers, to ensure that events occur such that the knot is preserved. For example, we see Claudia from this alternate world show up and meet Claudia Prime in the same scene that we saw earlier in the season when they both meet for the first time. One interesting one is Noah has to bring his younger self into the past so he and Elizabeth fall in love. And I'm not sure exactly how he pulls that off because we basically see him bring Elizabeth into the bunker. What did he tell Elizabeth to get her down there? And how does it go from, I just brought you to this strange bunker and now you're in love with this young guy that you just met? And they need to fall in love so the two of them can have a child who grows up to be Charlotte. I'm assuming the reason it works is because it is sort of a destiny thing where they have an invisible bond between them. So when they meet, it'll sort of be love at first sight. Kind of like, Alt Marta, who met Jonas, and within a few days, they are in love to the point where she is willing to go to the ends of the earth to save him. Meanwhile, while Eva is enacting her endgame, back on the Prime World in 2053, we rejoin Adam where he is doing the same. He has Marta tied up, now changed into that white gown, wearing the St. Christopher necklace. Now, I'm not sure why she had to change into that clothes. I think it may be a symbolic gesture or something from Adam where he wants her in her final moments to be a Marta that he recognizes from way back in the day. What she's wearing resembles what she wore in the Ariadne play. So I think Adam just wants to see a vision of the Marta he once knew decades earlier. Adam does his villain monologue and basically shares that Francisca and Magnus, Charlotte and Elizabeth, etc., they've all been sent through the God Particle to complete their tasks and ensure the cycle occurs as planned, bringing us to this point. Marta's baby needs to be killed so the knots can be destroyed. However, Adam explains, we need to use this awesome machine I built, which focuses the energy from both apocalypses in order to destroy the matter, which comprises the child that Marta will eventually give birth to. So this goes back to the earlier point that Eva brought up. If you want to destroy something in the other world or something like this child that crosses between both worlds, it is very difficult or in her mind impossible to do so however adam thinks he's found a way to do it by creating this machine that crosses time and space as he said combining the power of both apocalypses he says there is no hope no salvation no paradise we're wrong you and i in your world and in mine then Adam activates the machine, and although he has his tough exterior, we can see the way he closes his eyes, he does feel something here, and I think is preparing 
for the end. This was probably the most on the edge of my seat I've been throughout this season and throughout this series. I felt like my heart was being ripped out of my chest as he turned that machine on because at this point, I have no idea what comes next. For all I know, when I turn on episode seven, it's going to be an entirely different reality than we've seen before. And I'm worried about all of our favorite characters. Is Adam going to succeed and destroy everything? I honestly have no idea, and I felt a wave of emotions watching this scene. Then, back on the alternate world in 2052, as Eve sends everybody into the time stream, into the portal between worlds, we get an incredible split-screen montage showing the Lipscard trio traveling to the nuclear plant in both worlds. Earlier in the episode, we saw the older and younger version of the trio head into the god particle then we saw the middle-aged version grab the spherical device which he uses to travel to our world so in the split screen we see that all three of them have divvied up between worlds they go to the nuclear plant to do what needs to be done in both realities to ensure the apocalypses both happen as planned we also see the rest of eve's folks going through the time stream to make sure everything occurs as planned we see Matt Magnus show up in the alternate world, meeting his younger self. We see middle-aged Marta go to 1888 in our world. She goes to leave the note from Marta and the four Charlotte pocket watch for older Jonas to find. We see the swirling mass of energy engulf Marta. Then Alexander opens the barrels to show Charlotte what he's covered up. And this is, of course, part of triggering the apocalypse. Older Egon visits Hannah in the alternate world, and it looks like she's having a miscarriage. And I wonder if this is an effect from the apocalypse being triggered, similar to how when people use the time tunnel, we see birds and other animals die. I'm not sure what Older Egon intends to do when he meets Hannah, we know that Hannah needs to go back in time to procreate with the younger Egon and create Celia. So my guess is that older Egon will sort of promise her a better world and take her back in time to set those events in motion. Then we end on a pretty beautiful moment. Earlier in the episode, Magnus and Francisca on the alternate world were talking about Marta's crazy ramblings where she thinks the apocalypse is coming. And Francisca says to Magnus, if the world ends, we'll be together. And we end on a shot of the two of them sitting by the lake, watching as the black apocalyptic orb engulfs them. So like I said a few times already, in this episode, I was more on the edge of my seat than I've ever been watching Dark. My jaw dropped more than it's ever dropped while watching Dark. So overall, it was a pretty crazy, pretty great episode. I will say that the Jonas explanation for how he was able to be killed by Marta, yet still continue to exist in this sort of other Jonas iteration, I didn't necessarily hate that explanation, but I think I was hoping for something a little bit more intuitive, where when you hear it, you go, oh, damn, I get it, instead of, oh, um, okay, I think I get what you're saying. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. So, minor quibble. But other than that, thought it was a pretty fantastic episode. Now, in the end moments here, did Adam destroy the world? Was he successful? Eva seems pretty confident that Adam doesn't know what the hell he's doing. She says that Adam has never truly understood the connection between worlds. So a few possibilities here. Maybe Adam knows something that Eva doesn't. Maybe he's truly figured something out and figured out how to ultimately destroy the knots. Or maybe Eva's right and Adam thinks he knows what he's doing, but she knows something that he doesn't and what Adam is doing ultimately will fail. Or most likely, as always, it's something that I just don't see coming at all. As I've been doing these reviews, I've been forced to pace myself. I finish an episode and then I stop do a review before I let myself watch the next episode. So every time I do that, it requires some willpower not to hit play next on Netflix. And this time around, it probably took the most willpower of all the episodes. So I can't wait to see what happens in episode seven. 
I'm gonna go do that right now. So make sure that if you enjoyed this video to please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you get notified when that episode seven review is up a little bit later today and you get notified when we go live this evening. My plan is to watch episode eight, then go live shortly after to give immediate thoughts and reactions on the finale, on the season as a whole. We can hash it out. We can comfort each other now that this amazing show is done. And then this weekend, after I've digested that finale, I'll do a polished review for episode eight with screenshots like the other videos I've done for the rest of the season. So with that, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.